everyone. Welcome back to another episode of the Kayla Kai podcast. We're so glad that you could join us today, especially if you're preparing for something big like the ELAD test. Michael and I are excited to be your host again, and we have a great discussion lined up. That's right. We know how important test prep can be, and today we're diving into strategies and tips for tackling the ELAD test. But we're not just doing this alone. We've got an amazing guest with us, Dr. Nancy Tarahuti. Um, and she'll be sharing insights and advice to help you feel more prepared and confident. Before we dive deeper into today's topic, let's give our guest a chance to introduce herself. Dr. Talaviti, we're so happy to have you with us today. Could you start by telling our listener about yourself? Okay, thanks guys. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. So I'm Dr. Talaviti. I am the Dean of the Faculty of Education and Social Work. And I'm also um, the lead administrator for the ELAT test. Um, <clears throat> I am a faculty member in the EIL and TESOL program. And that's probably why I'm one of the lead administrators. Um, yeah. Is there anything else you want to know about me? <laughs> that's sweet. That's okay, sweet. cool. Thank so you. So you're the perfect person for our discussion today. Okay, great. <laughs> yeah. So we'll, we'll start with the first question. Could you provide us with a general overview of the ELAD English Admission Test? Like what it evaluate? Okay, so the ELAD is the English Language Admissions Test. Prior to this test, um, BYU Hawaii used tests that weren't very um, good at assessing English proficiency. So we would have students that would come here with very low language proficiency and would spend a long time in the EIL program. The problem with that is they would actually run out of semesters to graduate and would either end up just getting a an associate's degree or a minor in general studies which is actually a breach of their visa requirements. All students are given a visa based on the fact that they could speak English and they have enough capability to get a bachelor's degree. Mm -hmm. And so <coughs> we were <laughs> not following um, the rules of immigration. And so our department and Brother Green, Dr. Green was actually the lead researcher. He got a PhD in second language testing. He created our ELAT test and... Um, the t there are four tests in the ELAT. There's a reading test, a listening test, a writing test, and a speaking test. What we're trying to do is make sure that students have enough capability to come in and spend no more than two semesters in EIL and be able to take on the rigor of their um, coursework and the discipline that they choose. Each test, <clears throat> we used to actually before only provide two days to take the test mm -hmm. and we realized it wasn't enough time for students and because of the time difference in Hawaii and other countries yes. we really needed to give the students more time so now the students have a week to take the ELAC test wow. That's great. <clears throat> the, the problem with the week so this is why we had it on two days we would give the reading and listening tests on a Monday and the writing and speaking tests on a Tuesday Hawaii time so if you're five or six mm -hmm. hours behind or ahead, you yeah. had to adjust your schedule to accommodate. Mm -hmm. So when we went to a week, we actually had to make some changes. In order to make sure that students weren't um, encouraged to cheat, <laughs> mm -hmm. we had to then come up with several writing prompts. Before we only had one writing prompt and one speaking prompt. Now we have 10 writing prompts and 10 speaking prompts and the, it randomly selects it when you take the test. Oh. That way we can eliminate possibilities of cheating because sometimes we have a brother and sister taking the exam in the same household, but we don't want them to have the same writing prompt and the same speaking prompt. Mm. Um, <clears throat> and our test is progressively adaptive. What that means is you have to pass the reading test, which is the first test that's offered, in order to continue to take the listening test. The reading test is out of 23 points and students must get at least 10 out of 23. Mm. And that's not very high, that's less than 50%. Mm -hmm. So if a student can't get 10, then they really need some more English help before they get here. Once you pass the reading test, then you're able to take the listening test. The listening test is out of 20 points. 
and you must get 11 points out of 20 in order to take the writing and speaking tests. Mm. Now you might think, well, why 10 out of 23 and 11 out of 20 for two different tests? Because we're testing different constructs, it's not like you can compare the scores so easily. And so <clears throat> when we test listening, it's very different to how we test reading. And so um, that's basically it. If you pass the reading test and the listening test, then you are able or eligible to take both the writing and the speaking test. Um, and then the writing, the reading and listening tests are graded automatically through Canvas. The writing and speaking tests are graded by the faculty in our department and they're double rated just to give the kids a fair chance. Mm -hmm. So if one teacher gives it a four and another teacher gives it a three, then we give it an average rating and it's the average score that we take. Now, if one teacher gives it a five and one teacher gives it a three, that means they're kind of too far apart. Then we actually have a triple rater. So there's a lot of work that goes into the exams. Mm. And that's basically an overview of the ELAP. Okay, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, and for the speaking test, is it like you give them a plum and then they speak according to the plum or do you have like an interview with... Okay, that's a great question. It's actually a speaking prompt. And there, it depends on, you. there's 10 different prompts, so you're going to randomly give them one. Mm -hmm. um, and the students have to record themselves and then upload that recording. Mm -hmm. um, and they have 30 minutes to do that. When students run out of time to do the recording, this is what we've found in the past. Some Because so the recording is done with a camera as well. It's not just their voice. And we've seen some girls who record and record and record because they don't like the way that they look. <laughs> <laughs> this generation, well. <laughs> when they take selfies, they have to look great. But we're not grading them on their looks. We're only grading them on their speaking ability. Okay. I had one student say, I ran out of time. I'm like, why did you run out of time? It's asking for one speaking prompt and it's asking you to speak for three minutes. <laughs> And she goes, oh, I didn't look cute in the first one. Oh, my goodness. I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> so now I have to tell everybody to not be so concerned with mm. their appearance and really concentrate on their, their speaking. How they speak. Yes. Mm. Okay. Yeah. You already mentioned a couple of things that are like different from like other English proficiency exams like IO and TOEFL. Because like you can take, like you have a week to take the ELAD, but for... At a test, you can only have like one day to mm -hmm. test all of those four skills. And, but the content of the test in like reading and listening, is it the same as it in? Yeah, that's a great question. Yeah. We wanted to make our tests that same level of um, ability. Mm -hmm. So yes, the reading is from, the readings are taken from freshman textbooks. Oh. So they're typical readings that you would get here. Um, and it's at the same level of TOEFL and IELTS. Now, we've had some students who take the ELAT and they don't pass, but then they take the TOEFL and the IELTS and they do pass. Oh. And representatives from their countries have asked me, Dr. Tarafiti, why are these students failing the ELAT but passing um, the IELTS and TOEFL? And when I looked into it and did a little bit of research, it was so clear. So the Difference, but the major difference between the ELAT and the other test is our test is free. Oh, the and they IELTS, pay for the other one. yes, IELTS and TOEFL can be up to two to three hundred dollars. True, and in That's some crazy. countries it could be up to seven hundred dollars, depending on mm. their um, conversion of their dollar. And so the student who took the ELAT test did not prepare at all, didn't put any time in, and so they didn't pass. But when they knew they wanted to come to school and they needed a test, they took the IELTS test. But they put a lot more preparation into the IELTS. Mm -hmm. Why? Because yeah. it cost them $300. Mm -hmm. We term that skin in the game. When you have skin in the game, then you're going to put in more effort. But when the test is free, there's no skin in the game. So <clears throat> I found out that that student put a lot more skin in the game for the IELTS because their family had to fork out $300 for that. And it was interesting, that student did really, really well in the IELTS. I'm like, man, I wish you put just as much effort into the ELAT. So he didn't even finish one of the tests because he just wasn't even paying attention. Um, <clears throat> so that's the major difference between our test and the other test. And we wanted to do that because we wanted our students to have a fighting chance of showing English proficiency. 
without the um, burden of paying the huge cost. Otherwise, all the tests, the tests are, are very equal in terms of proficiency level. Mm. That's, I don't know, like hearing you say it and actually explaining how um, different, like the different tests are, is just crazy to me. Because I feel like I did put effort when I, when I did my tests before and it was hard. Um, and you know, with like the preparation that you, you have, sometimes it just, it's, it's a surprise sometimes with the prompts. Um, and it, that was very difficult because I was taking my visa interview and the test at the same day. That and, was scary. And so that's one thing we, we do encourage students to take, not to take all their tests in one day. We encourage students, once they understand the dates of when the tests are going to run, to really arrange their schedules mm -hmm. so that they have, that they can be rested and not having to run home from a job or anything like that. We've even had students take a few days off from their work and just put all their focus on the ELAT because it is free. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah. Okay. Um and that's good to know um, for the preparing students. So what are the key skills that students should focus on when preparing for the ELAT exam? Um, that's a great question. These are all great questions. <laughs> <laughs> I went to Fiji this year in April, and I wanted to set up a um, computer at the church high school there, a computer lab, where people in the community could go and take their ELAT tests at the high school. And that was because some of our students don't have good internet connection in their homes. And so while I was there, I actually tested some people. Wow. So going back to your question, the very I did little information sessions at night in the stake centre and um, at the schools. And I asked people, you know, how many pages a day, no, how many pages of English reading do you do a day? I said 20, nobody raised their hand, 10, a couple raised their hand, 5. <laughs> so it's really hard to take an English test mm -hmm. when you haven't been doing any reading in English. We're going to have you take a rigorous reading test, but you haven't done any reading in English. So my first key skill is to have students read an English book in between the ELATs, you know. <clears throat> and, and the book doesn't have to be academic. If it is, and if it's in the field that you want to study, that's great. But even if you're just reading a, a pleasure book, something that you enjoy, you're going to get used to the sentence structure. You're going to see vocabulary that's used, and you're going to be able to recognize that when you take a reading test. Um, <clears throat> we have practice tests in the ELAN. Mm -hmm. Um we notice that there are a lot of students that are taking the ELAT that do not take the practice test. So we don't make the practice test um, compulsory. It's totally up to the students to do that. I highly recommend you take the practice test, not just to see if you can pass or not, but also to have a look at the type of questions that are asked because they're going to be similar types of questions that you take in the ELAT exam. So really, the practice exams are a good way to analyse the readings, analyse the type of questions, and then get used to that. Um, <clears throat> other things that people can, students can um, do for preparation is speaking more English than their native language. A lot of the students have just spoken their native language mm -hmm. and then they come to take an English speaking test. Um, so I encourage students at least a month before they take the ELAT to speak 90 to 100% of the day in English. Find opportunities to do that. Um, <clears throat> also listening to um, academic English texts. I know a lot of your generation likes to <laughs> YouTube. Yes. But to do YouTube and listen to um, TED Talks in English, all those things really do help learning to write argumentative essays where you are trying to justify a point. Um, and there are TOEFL and IELTS free prep courses online that you can use as well. All right. Um, going with what you said about 
um, you know, being able to prepare for the exam. Because I remember my brother, my brother calling me because he just came this semester. We talked about his tests. Um, he did worry because he thinks that he didn't pass. I'm pretty sure he did pass because he's here right now. <laughs> um, but then we were talking about the tests and he was telling me all about like the prompts and how it's structured. And I couldn't say anything to him just because I didn't know what was in the test. And I thought like, yeah, it's different because during my time, they maybe had other prompts and, you know, maybe it was like easier or harder. I, I, I don't really know the difference. And so going with another question, what are common mistakes students make while preparing for or taking the ELAT exam? The most common mistake is just not reading instructions. <laughs> oh that is the 95% um, common mistakes that have made. Not reading instructions on setting up your account to take ELAT. Not reading instructions carefully to enroll in the Canvas course. Not reading instructions of how many points to pass each test. Not reading instructions on how to set up Proctorio. And not reading instructions when they take the tests. For example, let me give you a really good example. And if you're listening out there, this will be very helpful to you. On the writing test, it clearly says you need, right now it does. We probably have changed it since you took the test. It clearly says you need to write at least three paragraphs. So some students still just write one big paragraph and they lose a lot of points on that. They potentially show that they did not understand the prompt or the instructions, which is um, a lower level of proficiency. Mm -hmm. So I think students do that because they haven't given themselves enough time and practice to be in the right headspace to take the tests. But the, the common mistake that students are, are making is that they're just not reading instructions. So during the week of the ELAT, I get several emails. Um, not as much as I used to. I think the first two times we took it, I counted, I nearly had over 500 emails. And a good 280 of those were asking questions of things that were in the ELAT course. I tried my best to answer every single one of those emails, but poof took a lot out of me now what I do is I look at all the frequently asked questions and each morning before the test I send out a video to everybody and say hi this is day one of the ELAT test if you're taking the ELAT test here are the most common questions that have been asked so they can see my face they feel a little bit like they're supported in what they're doing and <clears throat> I put on a happy face even though all the emails are related to things that they've already been told. <laughs> um, so we, we've done a lot of changes over the past few ELATs in order to make that process a little bit easier. But that is the most common mistake. Just not reading um, Oh, that and also not taking note of the time that they have. So in the corner at the bottom there, if you're listening, <laughs> you'll see a little clock and it tells you how much time you have and how much time you have left. So you'll have to, in the instruction it says you'll have 60 minutes for this test. So if you're at 45 or 50, then you should know you should be getting towards the end there. Mm, that's nice. So about the writing exam, mm -hmm. what do you think are the qualities of a strong essay? The qualities of a strong essay? Yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. One quality, the major quality actually is responding to the prompt correctly. In most cases, it's an argumentative essay. For example, the prompt may say, some students like to study on their own, while others like to study in the group. Which do you prefer? And then please explain reasons for your preference. So I'm looking for something that says I like to study on my own because or I like to study in a group because or actually I like both of them because and the reasons need to justify that. I've had students that say I like to study on my own but the reasons they give say that they like to study with a group. So the reasons do not match their preference. Or some students start writing about how they studied and when they were young and studying was fun for them. So they've really written about the word study, but nothing else. Once our readers see that, it's a clear understanding they do not have the ability to understand what the purpose of their writing is. 
So purpose is the key component for the writing exam. Then after that, it's clarity and cohesion. Clarity is your accuracy with your language. Cohesion is making sure all your sentences connect together seamlessly. Some students write about something and then they totally go off on another subject. And I'm like, wait, what's happening here? <laughs> so when the writer cannot understand what's being written, that's what lowers their scores. Mm. Yeah, Um. you mentioned about like, like beside giving um, an, a clear answer and a reason for the plumped, um, do you grade, uh, do you evaluate based on like the wide range of vocabulary that the student use? Yeah, too? that's a great question. One thing we do offer the students is they're able to see the rubric that we grade their papers on. So I always tell students, go and look at the rubric so mm -hmm. you'll see how to get a good grade. If you would like to get a low grade, look at all the things you need to do to get a low grade. But obviously you want the high grade. Oh. And vocabulary is in there. It's not a huge component. I would rather a student write an essay with very simple language and it's clear mm -hmm. than high academic vocabulary and it's very complex and mm -hmm. I can't understand what they're mm -hmm. saying. So clarity is preferred over complexity. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, you did mention a while ago that there are, when taking the tests, especially the first couple of tests before ELAT, um, that there are like maybe websites that they can use online. Um, would you mind if you could like name those websites or maybe like books that they can use you, in order for them to prepare? Yeah, you can actually, um, there are TOEFL prep um, examples that you can use online and even IELTS prep and they don't cost anything. I actually know of a few of my previous TESOL students who are running ELAP prep courses in their countries. There's a young man in the Philippines I believe, his name is Mark Io. He was a student of mine and I heard that he's doing prep courses and he's a great person to do that because he was a TESOL major, he understands the nuances of language and so that is great. There's also another student in Tahiti, I believe, who is trying to set that up. His name is Artea, and he was an intern with me. Mm -hmm. So he would be another great resource. I have another student who is in Vanuatu, and he wants to help students there as well. So we have a lot of um, alumni, especially fresh alumni, yeah. who were in my classes. <laughs> great students great helpful people and they would be able to um, help students in different countries. We're trying to set up a little bit more of those satellite sources. Our, unfortunately our practice tests are only available two weeks before the exam but it's still two weeks where they have lots of time to look at it. At the moment um, Brother Green and one of and a student right now is looking at a way of putting that on the internet where it can be looked at any time of the year. So we are looking at ways to do that. I don't have any particular sites um, that I can give you at the moment, just off the top of my head. Um, but if you're just looking for reading practice, you can even ask, funnily enough, AI to help you with reading practice. Um, but, yeah, is that helpful? Sorry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, it is. Um, yeah. yeah, and we love that because, you know, preparation takes time. Um, and as you've said, it's two weeks before you actually put out the practice test. And it's better if you prepare before that as well. We also ask them to take the practice test too to make sure that they're in good test-taking conditions. Um, because it all gets videoed through Proctorio. So I've watched some of the videos and some kids are trying to take a test and there's a chicken running around in the background. <laughs> Someone's yelling out, what do you want for dinner? <laughs> um, and so those aren't really good test-taking mm -hmm. conditions. To, it's almost like you're, you're here on campus taking a test. It needs to be quiet so that you can have clear thought. And then some of the students are taking tests in the dark. Like they're in a room with all the lights off. I'm like, how do they even see the screen? Those are not good test-taking conditions either. So we really, I, we really do encourage students to find somewhere quiet and that's why we've tried to get the schools up in the Pacific to be able to take some of the students in to take the test because it's in a computer lab, it's got air conditioning, it's got good internet connection, good web camera, good headset, 
all those things that they need to do well in the test. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, do you have any memor memorable success story of student who struggled initially but then succeeded through the their preparation of, for the ELAC? Yeah, I love seeing the ELAC kids because they all know who I am because I send out videos all the time. This year at the Holokai Fair at the beginning of the semester, I met a group of kids from the Philippines. <laughs> They're so cute. <laughs> They're like, Dr. Taravidi, we know who you are. You're like a rock star in our country. <laughs> and I said, you know, I'm sure people want to throw darts at me because they didn't pass the test. But there was one young man there who said, he he sent me a question. And he said to me, what if I don't pass the reading practice test? And I said to him, well, then you need some more practice with your reading. Um, you shouldn't come here if you're getting a low score in the practice test. Because when you take the actual test, you're not going to do well. Well, he took what I said to heart and he went back and practiced. So when he took the actual test, he did really, really well. And so I took a picture with him. I'm not too sure what he's doing with the picture. Maybe he's sending <laughs> it home to his family. I also met um, students in Fiji who um, really prepared for the exam. And they came in and took it in the evening. And they did such a great job. Um, they actually took all their tests on the same day because they had other things on. But I sat there the whole time while they took their tests. And um, it was so good because they took a break in between each one and they got a little bit more encouraged. When they took the reading test and passed, they're like, yes. I'm like, okay, take a little break, go for a little walk outside. And they had dedicated their whole night to take tests and they came in and set the listening test. They're like, yes. I went, oh, this is great. It was great for me to see them succeeding. It was great for me to be there and be a resource for them if they needed any help and they didn't which told me that they have a really good range of English proficiency I met one student who signed up he registered for the test but he didn't take it he just forgot about it didn't put any time or effort and then he had to pay for over five hundred dollars to take the um, IELTS test because that's how much it cost in Fiji and I said how did you do in the IELTS he told me his scores he did really really well I said, you would have smashed the ELAT. He goes, I know, it was a really expensive exercise to learn. But I'll never do that again. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I love hearing stories like that and, and hearing students being grateful that the ELAT is free for them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, It's amazing. Um, and yeah, it, because it's free, um, they shouldn't take it for granted. Yeah. Um, so, but in what ways does preparing for the ELAT help students, not just for the admissions, obviously, because, you know, they want to come here, mm -hmm. but like with success in university link, uh, level English courses? Yeah, that's a great question. I think once they take the ELAT, they're going to understand the type of readings that they're going to get here. If they're taking psychology, you know, it's going to be quite different to the books that they're reading at home. They get a real in-depth, quick look as to what sort of readings they need to be involved in. So I also tell students at the end of the ELAT, I said, if you pass the ELAT and you know what your major is, go online and find a book that's related to your major and purchase that book and just slowly make your way through it. When you get to BYU, you'll be able to be one step further ahead. You'll be able to understand some of the language. You'll be able to understand some of the vocabulary that's there. And it'll just give you a head start as you get going. Um, and before, too, students used to think it was such a, um, they said, oh, it's so embarrassing, I'm taking EIL. <laughs> EIL is not an embarrassing situation. Yeah. What it is, actually, it gives you a little bit of time to adjust to a different country, mm. working, going to school, and you'll be able to see this is how they write essays in the United States. And by the time you hit your major classes, you're all good to go. Um, one thing we have found is that our ELAT, the students who are passing the ELAT, are coming in at a higher level, actually. And so we have to up our game in EIL. Our teaching has to has, has gotten a little bit more um, rigorous so that we can handle the high level of students that are coming in. I love it. It's amazing. It's, it's going into the future, of, mm -hmm. you know, having more, I don't know, exams and tests that really that make an impact, yeah. and they have a direct correlation to university. True. Since we've done the ELAT, our probation number of students in EIL has halved less. So we 
we used to have 30, 40 from academic one, 30, 40 from academic two. This last semester we had seven and six. And those students, they're on probation, not because of language, mm-hmm. <laughs> because of poor decision making. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. So that's been a real positive for us. Okay, thank you so much for being here today and um, giving us this helpful advice on how like this, how we can prepare and how to avoid a common mistake like not reading the instructions, and yeah, with that we're wrapping up today episode. Um, thanks again to all our listener for tuning in. If you found this episode helpful, don't forget to subscribe, leave us a review, and share it with others who might be benefited from this video. Okay, we'll be back soon um, with more episodes, so stay tuned for the next one. Um, and ELAD is happening in seven, six days? So right now, it is the ELAD preparation two yes, weeks. The preparation. We have several students that have currently registered, but they have not enrolled in the Canvas course. Um, so if you're out there listening yes, please and listen. you've registered for the ELAD, please make sure that you enroll in the Canvas course. If you have any questions about enrollment, that goes straight to admissions department. Um, And then make sure you take the practice test before the test. Uh, The ELAT begins next Monday, um, September the 30th, and it goes till Friday, October the 4th, Hawaiian Standard Time. So it'll open at just over midnight Hawaii Standard Time on September 30th, and it'll close at 11.59 p.m., on Friday, October the 4th. Please make sure you do not wait till the last minute because you will run out of time. Um, And good luck to all you ELAT people out there. Good luck, guys. Good luck, guys. Hello, everyone. See you next time on the KLK Podcast.